fifth event of the Feminist and Accessible Publishing and Communications Technology Speaker and Workshop Series. This is the fifth of about 20 events that will be happening in 2019. So we hope that you uh, come to our other events as well. Um, and you can follow us on our Facebook page as well as this website. I know it's kind of a really long title of a series, but we want to uh, incorporate everything. Uh, so I'm Dr. Alex Ketchum. I'm a professor at McGill's Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies, and I'm the organizer of this series. This series seeks to bring together scholars, creators, and people in industry working at the intersection of digital humanities, computer science, post studies, disability studies, communication studies, LGBTQ studies, history and critical race theory, um, and we hope to bring forward critical approaches to publishing practices, communication strategies, and techniques for making research dissemination more accessible. Part of the motivation of this series is that while humanities scholars in particular will critique traditional academic publishing and communications technologies as being sexist, classist, racially biased, and inaccessible, the kinds of solutions that are often proffered, such as open access, such as innovative new technologies, and this kind of like blanket term that's very vague, etc., often romanticize and fetishize technological alternatives and don't look up how inequity can perpetu be perpetuated or shifted, even at the level of algorithms. As we seek to draw attention to power relations that have been invisibilized, it's important that we acknowledge Canada's long colonial history and current political practices as we are currently located on unceded territory. This series was made possible thanks to the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the IGSF of McGill, MILA, the Dean of Arts Development Fund of McGill, Media of McGill, McGill's Department of History and Classical Studies, the William Dawson Fund, RICAF, the Movie and Image Research Laboratory, Element AI, and the Guillaume Montreal's Feminist Bookstore. Um, just for this room, um, there's only one door that works as an exit, so just in case. Um, there's also a washroom down the stairs. Um, and I also want to let you know that we're recording this event in order to make the series as accessible as possible. And so we'll put it on our website so people who can physically be present are here. Um, but the way that the film is being recorded, no one's like being recorded. So, um, And if you ask a question in the question period, like, your face won't be on film. Uh, so now for today's event. So Suzanne Kite is an Ogala Lakota performance artist visual artist and composer raised in Southern California with a BFA from Cal Arts in Music Composition, an MFA from Bard College's Milton Avery Graduate School, and is a PhD student at Concordia University and research assistant for the Innovative Indigenous Futures. Her research is concerned with contemporary Lakota epistemologies through research creation, computational media, and performance practice. Recently, Kite has been developing a body interface for movement performances, carbon fiber structures, immersive video and sound installations, as well as co-writing the experimental electronic imprint on her records. So I'm now going to turn the floor over to Suzanne. Thank you. Yes. All right, so um, the title of my talk is non Human Futures. Um, and I wanted to start by kind of fully introducing myself with this silly head thing on. Um, so I'm Suzanne Kite. Um, as Alex said, I am a Gual Lakota, so if you're not familiar with that nation, um, we are primarily based in South Dakota, um, but there are lots of diaspora communities um, all over the U.S. and in Canada, Manitoba and Saskatchewan, um, and especially in Los Angeles, uh, where I am I'm from, more or less, South California. And so, uh, here uh, in Montreal, I'm a PhD student um, at the Initiative for Indigenous Futures, and we, um, uh, my research has started before then, obviously, and I'm going to talk about um, how I got to the research that we're doing now, and uh, the research that we're doing now, um, I, will, I will talk about, um, uh, which is more related to AI. Uh, so, so I want to give a few examples of my art practice um, to lead up to why I'm asking the questions that I'm asking and um, my interest in computation and art forms. So play like a little clip of my of an older composition. So in this video, um, I'm taking rocks and putting them on the floor, and there is an accelerometer which knows when my arm tilts all the way to So um, I began uh, my, before I was a composer, I was a violinist, 
and um, as a violinist, I, I mean, if you've just heard me talk, I think some of you were at Alex's analysis class, you've heard me say all this about um, compositional stuff, but um, when I was a violinist, I uh, quickly became, not quickly, after 20 years of being a violinist, I got quite fed up with playing um, the music of dead white men, and I was very frustrated um, with a lot of the aspects of uh, classical music and, and even with other kinds of music. Um, but one thing that uh, particularly interested me was um, the way the body can become subsumed in performance, the way that, um, that playing one can get lost in uh, music or disassociated. And so um, in the, I, I had a lot of other compositional styles before this, but I started to make sonification, which is specifically um, a form of taking data and turning it into sound, similar to, to the idea of visualization where you take data and turn it to visuals. So um, this piece actually was, uh, let's see, I was taking um, 80 rocks and simulating the, uh, the tip into white noise. So this is a series called Omega, and I was trying to sonify different, um, separate different um, phenomenons of counting to infinity. And so one of the ways our brains can count to infinity is around 80 tones, uh, just like separate tones, after about 80, we stop hearing tones separately and we start to hear noise. And actually we start to hear white noise because we can't actually distinguish between the bands. White noise is infinite numbers of tones um, played at once, but our brains can't actually hear those, so we start to hear, we start to hear what we think is white noise. Um, and, but what was most, uh, look, you come in. The door is here, we'll be through the door. Uh, what was most interesting to me about this piece and, and uh, was the physicalization of putting the rocks on the floor and, and creating, um, creating the white noise bubble. And the thing is, uh, I've experienced that complete dissolution of the self just like with playing violin. Uh, so, so the next thing I was uh, trying to do was I was trying to understand what the body's um, engagement to uh, the data was, like what was happening when I was creating data as well as perceiving data uh, in performance, um, uh, in the mode of hearing, um, in the mode of feeling. And so I was thinking about, I started to think things about things in, in a circular way and I, and I still, this is still my goal for performance um, and my goal for composition is to put the body um, within this cycle where sonification is occurring, visualization is occurring, tactilization is, is occurring, and in these in-betweens, um, not only is my body creating data, but also the computer is creating data, and there's multiple interpreters and creators happening at the same time. So um, this is the first interface uh, I, I made uh, for a piece called People You Must Not Look, you must not look At Me. People, you must look at me. And uh, it, so when I make interfaces, I still try to keep them as simple as possible. First of all, as replicatable as possible, but also um, uh, you don't need that much to explore, in my, in my feelings, you don't need that much to explore, um, uh, to explore computation as an instrument, to, uh, just as you don't need much in, in a violin. Violin is an extremely simple uh, tool. And I find the simpler the tool, um, the farther you can, you can go in. So um, first, uh, as you can see, these uh, I've got um, there's a radio, uh, the XB, which talks to the computer um, wirelessly. You've got um, touch sensitive, um, force sensitive resistors, uh, and we've got um, an IMU inertial motion unit. So it knows. Um, I think this this was an early one. It only like, had three axes, but then it was seven axes, and now it's back to like four axes. And, but, the, but to me, um, sometimes you only need one. You only need one uh, stream of data from these things to, to do something interesting. Um, let's see. Which then controls so, live and oh, I've got a, so here is the open source software. I'm just going to pause it. So um, I, still, I always use open source, open source software. This is something um, for uh, Arduino and, and processing. Um, and you can see I've got, you know, which of the 17 screens you're looking at right now. Um, you've got roll, pitch, and yaw, and uh, possible, possibility of two FSRs. So, uh, composition. So, uh, I'm going to play a little clip from People You Must Look At Me.
So in this clip, as dark as it is, you can see that I'm wearing the interface and moving in projections that I'm affecting at the same time. where it would move, but since the axis was kind of like a, a very loose spin, um, I never knew it was going to be, so I always had to follow it. Um, and in this section I'm using the FSR uh, on my body. I built some other ones for the audience uh, to play with, to use, to see their, their data stream. And I see as they pick them up, obviously, starts to affect the data, and um, kind of the most interesting thing to me was that people, what, some of the feedback I got was about, um, oh, it, oh, it's the, uh, it's, uh, it's, un, it's un, unprocessed data, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, uninterpreted, it's just streaming, but, um, and, and that always, I always come back to that thought because it always reminds me that, uh, yeah, of course, it's not just streaming, there was so much, there's so much, so, so much going on from the building of the objects um, to, the, uh, to, to the soldering of the boards, to the way I got it to project and, and format it, and oh, there's so much manipulation, but when you experience it, um, it falsely feels like there's almost nothing going on. Um, and I don't know if that's a trick about numbers or a trick about the way humans um, uh, desire to see computation, but I thought there was something there. So um, this piece, uh, you know, I'm, I'm as an indigenous artist. My my work is is primarily a, a about um, a Lakota philosophy, and so this piece was about um, kind of unfolding an experience of a family death in a cocoon of like tactile storytelling. Um, but I, you know, I try to make pieces with, with many layers, uh, with indirect to direct relationships, especially in the way the body is. And the, comp and the computational system is built. Um, I try to enact uh, what I'm trying to do in storytelling and in the art making, especially in structure, uh, inside uh, the computational structures and the decision making that I'm making when I set up the computer to listen to itself, to, to loop itself, to, um, uh, to move data into directions that it doesn't actually want to go in, in, um, in MIDI or in um, OSC messages. So, I'm going to skip this one. Well, I'll talk about it for a second. So this piece um, has to do with kind of the, the other side, or not even the other side, it's just another aspect to my, to my work. So this piece is, um, is, is called Everything I Say is True. And this one um, particularly engages with uh, what I see as Lakota, Lakota structure. And, um, so in this piece, I took uh, the form of a uh, sweat lodge my grandfather uh, had me participate in. He was teaching um, some people in Apple Valley, California, how to do a sweat lodge. And from that, um, I took the, not never the content, because it's his content to give, but I took the form he was using to convince people to believe him uh, and adapted that into a, a a script, a performance, there's like a dress, there's animation, there's all, there's some interactive um, uh, video artworks with uh, uh, LiDAR. And uh, in this piece, I'm, I'm consistently looking like I'm controlling um, the computational aspect of it, like I do in all my other works, but in this work, I'm actually not doing anything. I've, it's, a, it's all a magic trick. Um, and uh, this was kind of a, a test to see if I was, if I could engage with these structures that had to do with my questions about computation and about magic and about Indian magic and perce perceptions of magic and perception of computation, um, but do it without doing it, affecting anything um, in the computer itself uh, by by composing it for the viewer to experience um, without any reality. There's still reality going on, obviously. Um, so, to rush through that and talk about, oh, getting caught, okay. To talk about um, my more recent work called uh, Listener. And so, uh, 
After my MFA, I came here to Montreal to do a PhD uh, with Jason Lewis um, and work in the Initiative for Indigenous Futures. And um, after about a year, I think I, I think last year, the year before, in the fall, I did a workshop that they, they have given to students. The workshop is called um, uh, Seven Generation Character Design, and it has mostly been, you come in, it's the only door. You're looking for this room. 150. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no worries. And um, so Jason uh, and Scalinati gave this workshop. And it was, so seven generation character design was um, meant to have uh, students in, in college or, or high school uh, imagine themselves seven generations in the future, where it's actually quite difficult for, um, for indigenous people to do that because things seem like seven generations could even happen. So in this, ex so we did it um, as adults, and I came up with a, um, not only a storyline, but a, uh, some technology that I wanted, I wanted to create. Uh, so I'm just gonna play some of the, the final results. It'll play for about five minutes. And state of birth is 1959, 1220. Ian, I hope you're fine in the area. And now we currently have female on the phone saying he's extremely depressed. His name is, And then the centric one, and then the centric one, and then the centric one. 
And then the centric one solid is holy. There, all that is holy. There. So, um, there's a lot going on in this piece, but um, let me just explain kind of what, what you just saw. So this is the score that I started with. I had a, uh, a lot of, well, most of my work uh, kind of obsesses over structure and what structure can do um, and, and what the structure has done. And so in this piece, I tried to, first of all, start by asking what kind of time I wanted to work with. And I had a nice conversation with Scott Venice in a band pan, and he's like, oh, have you tried spiral time yet? And, no, I hadn't tried <laughs> spiral time yet. So I tried some spiral time in this. Um, and this relates um, to the way I set up um, the computer internally as well. So uh, firstly, I, um, I wanted a new interface. Because before, I was working with interfaces on the body. And I wanted to work with an interface um, that uh, asked myself, OK, what Lakota people in the future, what do we value? We really value our hair. Um, we only cut it um, in order to offer it in some way. And the, uh, I decided to make a hair braid interface um, that could be an extra sensory, extra perceptor for my, for my body. And, um, and then I think in this one, in this version, it only had an accelerometer at the time. And on the back, um, so the designs that you saw in the video are Lakota women's geometry. Um, kind of traditionally, women make the, the geometrical patterns, which have extremely embedded amounts of um, information in them, and talk about. Um, talk about almost anything within the community, but um, they, we don't use fi figures, like human-like figures. The, the men would generally draw the, uh, the human, human looking forms. And, um, and so then when I created the, the video, uh, which is being controlled by the hair, which I'll get to, uh, the, I, had the, I had it doing what I feel like these designs are always doing. They're, they seem to be grow out and out and out and out, and they can go on and on forever. Um, if you if you have enough beads, um, I'm just going to show a couple of photos from installations. Uh, here's the hair with, uh, with some other things wrapped up in it, um, sweet grass and, and sage. Here's a close up of the embroidery. So now I'm at the point with this embroidery where it's uh, it can also be involved in um, as an interface. So I, I use a conductive thread. So uh, let's see if I have a slide on my coat. Um, all right, so I'm gonna talk about the, the words for a second. So there's there's two there's two streams happening in when we're listening to the sound. We've got uh, firstly the stream on um, which is uh, what what you're hearing from the police scanner. So depending on where this piece is staged, there'll be the police scanner from the local. Um, uh, the local police scanner, except when I did it in Linz, and apparently it's illegal to have police scanners in um, Europe. So <laughs> we had to listen to the Los Angeles one. And everyone had a knife out that day. But, uh, uh, and then the other stream of audio we hear is, uh, is myself talking, and I set up the audio. So I'm, I'm reading through some, some poetry that I both collected and arranged. Part of it is um, either a little bit of uh, speculative futurist fiction um, that I wrote, or um, a dream that I had, or um, kind of famously the uh, uh, the Six Grandfather text, which is um, Black Elk, uh, also translated in Black Elk Speaks, uh, which is a prophecy uh, that was that was relayed by Black Elk, who's Lakota. And then the third um, stream of sound is the actual hair braid. So, so my goal with this was where it's supposed to be have spiral control. So uh, I, I move or I'm talking, and so the hair braid moves, and then the hair braid controls um, a synthesizer, um, makes it makes it synthesize, and then um, they then I set up um, a, a listening channel which analyzes the highs and lows and, and picks out different frequencies, and when certain frequencies are achieved um, by the synthesizer. 
uh, the, I have a, a Weaponator um, machine learning software which is listening uh, to that data stream um, and uh, it has been taught, you know, the learning, the machine learning process to, to turn and make that bubble with the Lakota geometry grow um, in a certain direction in a certain way um, for a certain length of time. And then, since I'm looking at the bubbles, and kind of the bubble projected on the floor, then I'm making my directional decisions um, while wearing the hair, uh, and then, then, I, then that starts the cycle all over again. And so what I was hoping to achieve was that um, each time um, I go around this compositional circle, this compositional spiral, that each time I hit it, um, the spiral can get tighter and tighter and tighter, and decision making can get um, uh, more and more confused. Uh, am I making the decision? Um, is the is uh, Rebecca Freebrink, who wrote the original code for the Weaponator, making the decisions? Like, um, is it having anything to do with uh, the way the hair braid is? Am I hearing beyond? Is it some special code of power I've got to communicate with this hair braid? Um, I do not know. Yeah. So, um, just to wrap up the art stuff, um, I'm more and more obsessed with content and form. Um, I'm also interest, interested in what is convincing to me about computational systems, why, why they convince me that they're making reality, um, why they convince me that um, they're, uh, they're worth caring about. Uh, so and it's part of a larger question I have, what makes something convincing? What is truth in relation to belief? Uh, because it's, that truth and belief are very, very different in Lakota communities, uh, as I'll expand on. Uh, who makes truth and with what tools? Uh, um, is it stories? Is it gossip? Is it lies? Is it myths, facts? Uh, is it in text? Is it captions, attributions, quotes, reference pages, documents? Is it diagrams and charts? Is it someone standing at the front of a group of people with a microphone? Um, and, uh, and in my other work, I'm, I'm very interested in how conspiracy works um, in that and what is a conspiracy. Uh, The Berenstein and Bears conspiracy. Alright, so now I'm going to go into my, some of my research on non humans. So I want to speak uh, to our current and future relationships with and to non humans, especially to technology and artificial intelligence. Humans are already surrounded by objects which are not understood to be intelligent or even alive or even seen as unworthy or and are seen as unworthy of relations. How can humanity create a future with relations between technology or artificial intelligence and humans without an ethical, ontological orientation with which to understand what can be a relation and what cannot? What is a being and who is not? In order to create relationships with uh, any non-human entity, not just entities which seem human, the first steps are to acknowledge, to understand, and know that the non-humans are being in the first place. Indigenous ontologies already exist uh, and understand forms of being which are outside of humanity. I want to argue that indigenous ontologies are essential tools for humanity to create relations with the non-human. It is not only ignorant, but unethical to employ indigenous concepts and divorce them from their context. Communication through and between objects requires a contextualist, bio-regional <coughs> ethics, an ethics which is useless without respect of the non-human. So in the article, Postmodern Environmental Ethics, um, Ethics of a Bio-Regional Narrative, uh, researcher Jim Cheney writes, an important aspect of the construction or evolution of mythic images is their ability to articulate such moral imperatives and to carry them in such a way that they actually do instruct, that they locate us in a moral space and that which is at the same time the space we live in physically, that they locate us in such a way that these moral imperatives have the lived reality of fact. For a genuinely contextualist ethic to include the land, the land must speak to us, we must stand in relation to it, it must define us and we it. 
So the collapse of moral space into physical space is the bridge between subject and object worlds. Our indigenous mythologies and cosmologies provide this context in order to generate an ethics which relate humans to the world and everything in it. Understanding the differences between Western and Native American epistemologies, the way we uh, know what we know, is essential to imagining an ethical future with artificial intelligence. Establishing a discourse which does not prioritize the human ontologically begins with respect. So, Jim Cheney states in Truth in Native American Epistemology uh, that a ceremonial world is an actively constructed portrait of the world intended to be responsibly true. One which rings true for everybody's well-being. Uh, Cheney continues, it is a world built on the basis of an ethical epistemological, so an, an ethical epistemological altogether, both things together, orientation of attentiveness, or as Native Americans tend to put it, respect, rather than epistemology of control. Such ceremonial worlds uh, are built around the notion of responsible truth and not develop piecemeal. They are synthetic creations adjusted holistically to all the concerns that arise from a focus on responsible truth. They must tie down to the world of everyday practice and experience in a way that makes it possible to survive. They must orient the community and its individuals on the roads of life, a good road, 